Welcome to the second panel discussion of the day, which is putting the patient at the centre. A novel idea. Um, the balance of power is shifting from the prescriber, uh, indeed the drug company, I suppose, to the payer. Um, what are the implications of that? Um, what are the implications of the fact that uh, America has more of a, a market and certainly um, companies can advertise directly in a way they can't in Europe? How can the patient truly be involved uh, in decision making given the asymmetry of knowledge, even despite the best efforts of the World Wide Web? Um, and what mechanisms exist for um, feeding patients' requirements into the healthcare and pharma business so that they can better serve the people who are sort of kind of their customers. Um, we have four speakers to address this matter. Rules of engagement are the same, five minutes or thereabouts. And then we will have a panel discussion and questions from the floor. Um, and uh, in order of going, we have um, Patrick Flokel, who is uh, lead of the Ernst & Young Life Sciences sector team for a long one, this. The Euro Europe, the Middle East, India, and Africa. I think that's an even more weird geographical combination than Europe and Canada. Uh, we have Theresa Heggy, who is Senior Vice President of uh, Global Commercial Operations at Shire Human Genetic Therapies. Um, it's a company that works particularly on lysosomal storage diseases like Gaucher's disease. Um, these orphan, drug, orphan diseases that we were discussing earlier. Uh, we have John Pottage, who is Chief Scientific Medical Officer of Vive Healthcare, which is a collaboration between GlaxoSmithKline and Pfizer for a disease at the other end of the spectrum from being northern, which is HIV, um, a particular interest of mine. Um, I've covered HIV for The Economist since 1996, since the, uh, the great Vancouver AIDS conference when the protease inhibitors were first released and watched the uh, prognosis for people who are infected with HIV, utterly transformed by um, the work of people like you, uh, coming up with the right molecule, testing it. It's just been an extraordinary phenomenon. And for anyone who ever criticizes the drug industry, you've just got to look at the example of what was done with protease inhibitors and other antiretrovirals. Um, and finally, uh, Wendy White, who is founder and president of Siren Interactive, uh, which is... Um, a propaganda organization, I suppose. It's, a, it's an agency um, which is banging the drum, drum for the development of a therapist for rare, rare diseases. Um, she won the uh, Manny Hart Award, which is given, and I quote, agents, recognizing agencies' social responsibility and commitment to philanthropic, philanthropic and social causes in 2011. She's a board member of the National Organization of Rare Disorders. So our uh, panelists, thank you very much. Uh, Patrick, could you kick off? Sure. Thanks. So, um, where I'd like to start from is, you know, we all know about the healthcare system and the difficulty of sustainability of healthcare systems in uh, many parts of the world. And uh, what we believe is that to be able to make those systems sustainable, the way forward is really to put the patient at the center. And I will explain why. You know that, um, the major part of the cost in healthcare systems are related to uh, chronic diseases, 75% in the US, and we believe that to be able to continue uh, providing care, then focusing on these uh, chronic diseases will mean that we need to um, have patients take more care of their own health and self-management and uh, that requires major changes in behaviors. Major changes in behaviors from the patients themselves, of course. Uh, we'll have great examples, I think, uh, going on uh, later on. Uh, but also changes from all the actors uh, who will take part in the healthcare system, including, of course, the pharmaceutical industry, who can play a great role in um, uh, helping the, uh, the whole the, the patients become more at the center of the, of the system itself. The, the, the way um, uh, it, it would work is the, um, the, the pharma industry um, uh, playing a role in uh, linking better the uh, patients with the, the care through uh, evolving 
behaviors uh, that, they, uh, that they support. Uh, there is also another aspect where the, the patients are much more linked to the pharma industry in the development of R&D and new, uh, and new uh, drugs and new uh, products uh, to help them. The, uh, the, the, um, uh, in, many, in many cases, the um, uh, orphan drugs industry is a, or the orphan drugs part of the industry is a very good example of how this can be uh, done through uh, the use of technology, of course, with the, um, uh, the, the websites and the social media and social uh, 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 networks like uh, patients like me, uh, etc., which have helped bring patients together, exchange uh, information and, and knowledge about their disease, the way they deal with their disease, and the industry itself collaborating in there and learning lessons about how to improve the way they develop drugs, but also the drugs that they develop for uh, the patients that they address. And of course, uh, you can do that at different levels. Uh, so, uh, some of the, in some cases, it can be very territorial, helping a particular population in a particular country to take more charge of uh, what will keep them healthy because, of course, if we want to uh, alleviate the cost of uh, health care, the best way is for people not to become uh, sick and focusing more on health rather than sickness. Uh, and there the industry, again, can play a very important role in helping make the link between um, the, the, the health care system as a whole and people before they become ill, of course. Uh, you know, we shouldn't talk just about patients, but the population or the, cons the health consumer in a, in a way. So I think to be able to do all of this, uh, of course, we need a, a better alignment of incentives. Uh, and these incentives uh, can be aligned through really uh, working together in, in close collaborations between uh, public and private partnerships uh, and partnerships between the industry, governments, uh, non-for-profit associations, etc. Uh, and this creates this collective impact that will uh, make it possible for, uh, uh, for the system to become more sustainable. And the last point I wanted to, to make is when we talk about putting the patient at the center, we use an expression a bit like, you know, Starbucks described that expression as the third place uh, which was the Starbucks place, which outside of home and work, where people en engage in conversations. In the same way, we can talk about the third place for healthcare or the third places for healthcare, in a way, being the patient itself, because care will be delivered around the patient at the patient's place, outside of the doctor's office, outside of the hospital, but also at home and in various places, wherever the patient is. And that's the best and probably the most efficient way to, to provide continuous health uh, and make sure that we don't strain the system with interventions. Thank you. Theresa? Thank you. And um, maybe just first, thanks very much to The Economist for inviting Shire to speak today. And uh, a thanks to the sponsors as well for making all of this uh, possible. And. Uh, in particular, I guess, for being able to participate on this panel because uh, keeping patients at the center is, is really what Shire is, is, is all about. A little bit about Shire. Um, it's a specialty biopharmaceutical company, has a very strong UK heritage, having been founded just over 25 years ago, I think, in the Hampshire countryside. And uh, we, we really aspire to be as, as brave as the patients that we help. Um, as Jeffrey indicated, I work for the human genetic therapies business, and we really dedicate ourselves to bringing therapies to patients with life-threatening rare uh, diseases, such as Hunter syndrome, hereditary angioedema. Um, we, we've been asked to consider a number of different topics for the, the, the panel today, one of which is this, the implication of the shift from the prescriber physician to the payer. Shire created a, a circle of value which really helps to define the way we think about 
um, our work and the relationship of all the stakeholders in this circle of value, um, all working toward a, a common end of creating better lives for, for patients and perhaps for people because ultimately we you know, want to prevent patients too from, or people from becoming patients. But this, um, this circle includes all of the stakeholders, including, as we've heard already, the, the important four Ps, the, the physician, the prescriber, the patient, the payer, but also the, the, the policy makers. And as a business unit um, in human genetic therapies that, that really develops and commercializes innovative treatments, the patient has always been really close to the center of our work. Um, but this shift from prescriber to payer, which I think has probably been accelerated greatly in the economic climate that we find ourselves, has really caused us to underline um, our responsibility in helping to define, to quantify, and then be able to articulate the value of all of our therapies. And I think it's our responsibility in the industry to play a leading role in that. Um, last year here in England, um, Shire was invited to participate in a very novel, innovative process for assessing ultra-orphan drugs. This process was called AGNIS, which is uh, Advisory Group for National Specialized Services. And this was a very holistic approach involving many of the stakeholders in trying to define what value really is. And importantly for the topic of, of this panel today, the need of the patient was really at the, uh, at the center of, of this process. Um, another topic we've been asked to explore is how can patients truly be at the center of, of decision making? And um, working in the area of rare and orphan diseases, we have quite a special relationship, I think, with patient organizations who do play a leading role in trying to bring uh, therapies to uh, their affected family members. And we have a patient organization charter that really helps to define the relationship that we have with patient organizations. We think patient organizations are fundamental to the support and care both of the patient, but also the whole family is affected when, when a patient has a rare, rare disease. And we're highly committed to work with patient organizations in the rare and orphan disease space, but really do so in a spirit of transparency so that we maintain the integrity and the independence of the uh, patient organizations in this partnership. But the, the partnership with the patient organizations, but indeed with all the stakeholders, can, can bring about really wonderful and important things and are extremely important in both accelerating access to these really life-saving, uh, life-altering uh, treatments, but also importantly in maintaining access to these in the face as we find ourselves, for example, in this very challenging economic environment. But good relationships with patients and keeping them at the center can also help to improve the understanding and the awareness of these very rare diseases, many of whom physicians, prescribing physicians, don't know a lot about. Um, but also, importantly, accelerating, um, accelerating um, uh, enrollment in clinical studies, which in a rare patient population is, is one of the biggest challenges that we face. We've talked a little bit, I think, earlier this morning about some of the delays involved in pricing and reimbursement, and this is also an important area of, of partnership and where the patient can be and needs to be at the center of the process. There was an interesting um, process called CAVAD that uh, went on last year, this um, clinical added value of orphan drugs process, and one of the outcomes of the process is um, it proposed to provide a dossier from a working group within the European Medicines Agency to all the member states. And this, if you like, harmonization, the, the implication of that would be to shorten that pricing and reimbursement timeline, thereby accelerating access of these very important treatments to patients. So I very much look forward to a, a lively discussion, and, and thanks again for inviting me to participate. Thank you. John?
Well, I also want to express my thanks for the invitation to participate uh, in this panel. And I have uh, just a, a few uh, moments of perhaps informal uh, response to our formal part of this discussion. And I think the theme here that you're hearing from everyone is that clearly the patient uh, is and always has been the center of uh, the biopharmaceutical industry. But the nature of that relationship between the patient and the biopharmaceutical industry clearly is subject to huge amounts of changes at this time. And so I think uh, if we take a look at, say, the history of HIV, I think that's very instructive and brings out how things have changed over a relatively short period of time. And so, as you know, HIV was first uh, described uh, in 1981, so a little more than 30 years ago. Prior to that, I think the relationship of the patient to the biopharmaceutical industry, or even uh, between patient and physician, was more of the, the patient was more passive, uh, it was more of a paternalistic uh, type of relationship. Uh, and it would be just that, yes, we'll produce medicines for you in due time and they'll be coming along. Uh, HIV came along, a deadly disease, uh, and basically the patients took the lead there. They literally went into the streets, act up marching uh, on pharmaceutical companies, on the FDA, uh, on government agencies, uh, and really took the charge. And I think that that really galvanized and changed this relationship, uh, which is central to our business but made it much more of a uh, more of an equal partners where people are talking to each other, sharing information. And I think the biopharm industry certainly paid attention to it, woke up, as well as regulators, government groups, academics, and really thought of ways to speed things up. And I think that's what we saw with HIV. So within 10 to 15 years, we had medications uh, taken in combination that led to a situation where we took a deadly disease where people uh, uh, essentially can live close to a normal lifespan uh, to it. So it's been a huge miracle and it's been through that interaction of uh, keeping the patient, the, the pharmaceutical industry, government agencies, regulators kind of working together to uh, defeat a, a common foe, that being HIV. I think as we go forward, uh, these uh, differences, the relationships have really now, because we're sitting in a situation where uh, the economic situation is, has uh, dramatically worsened, there's a limited uh, sum of money, people are starting to have to make choices, how do we devote our uh, healthcare budget uh, to giving the greatest good uh, to the greatest number of patients. And so obviously choices uh, need to be made. And so changes have to go on with that relationship where people give and take, talk to each other in a transparent fashion. The formation of Vive Healthcare, I think, is also uh, an example of kind of the progress or changes that have occurred. So Vive, uh, as was mentioned, is the a joint venture between GlaxoSmithKline and Pfizer, and it's a group uh, put together, a company put together with only one focus, and that's the treatment of HIV disease. So there's only one therapeutic area that is uh, uh, dealt with. So what it has done with this focus, the group of people working, those of us working in VIV, only deal with HIV, we only think about HIV, we engage with the patients, with the activists, uh, regulators, and increasingly the payers. And because we have this focus, this concentration, I think that's led uh, to certainly, I think, over the two and a quarter years that we've been in existence, real improvements uh, going forward because taking the uh, uh, resources of two large companies, combining them, uh, I think was a, a first step. But right now we have a lot of scientific breakthroughs that are really pointing to a, a potential that we can cure HIV. But that's going to require a huge effort uh, uh, and much, much collaboration. And so by combining the resources of two large companies, focusing it in only one area, 
uh, and then reaching out to having the relationships, partnerships uh, with all these uh, different uh, contributors, I think uh, bodes well for the future as we go forward to develop uh, uh, therapies that will be curative. And uh, at the center of this is still the patient. And they just, as I said, have had uh, changes in, in the nature of the role, the urgency, et cetera. And I think it's all been for the, for the good of uh, patients and, uh, and it's, it's a very exciting time. Uh, and I think that these changes are, are welcome and will continue. And uh, hopefully we'll talk more about that uh, in this panel. So thank you. Wendy, the floor is yours. <laughs> All right, well, I wanna thank you as well. And I wanted to say as we think about putting patients at the center that uh, what all of these panel members have talked about um, are lessons that we can learn and, um, from chronic disease in the rare end of the spectrum, but they don't just apply to companies that are marketing rare disorders. I think when we think about what's happening, you could almost use as an analog or predictor of what's gonna happen in the future as we thin slice therapies and as we move down the road towards personalized medicine. So with my own particular focus on also in the rare disease space, I wanna tell you six things that we've learned at Siren Interactive in the 10 years that we spend exclusively marketing rare disease therapies. First, patients and caregivers feel alone and isolated, and they seek a connection with others like them. They use the internet to educate themselves and to support each other and to advocate for change. Physicians don't have the bandwidth to research every disease or therapy they may never see in their practice. There's a quote from Dr. Donald uh, Lindbergh, who is director of the medical library in Washington, D.C., and he said, if I read and memorized two journal articles every night from now to the end of the year, by the end of the year, I'd be 400 years behind. So doctors want to do the most good for the most number of people. They don't have the bandwidth to, uh, to address that. And what that leads to in our end of the spectrum is patients and caregivers are frequently the primary drivers of diagnosis and treatment. So the roles of all the stakeholders we've heard a little bit about have changed. Um, and that's something that we can look at for the future. And finally, and here's the thing that might be a little bit surprising to some of the people in the room, that patients want pharma to participate. If pharma participates where they add value, if they're authentic, transparent, um, working collaboratively, absolutely they want them to be sitting at the table. And the benefits of have, of, to pharma of having a more direct relationship include getting more patients on therapy, and patients living longer. And of course, that's good for patients, but it's also good business. And if this all works out and, and we really think about engaging patients um, in the whole process, all the way back from research through to the end, then I think it's also good for the public health. Uh, we talk, you talked about that on the panel a little bit before. Why should we, why should we pay attention to small patient populations? Well. I have a couple of answers to that as a, <laughs> um, one is innovation happens at the margins. So a lot of the things that we're seeing um, are, are predictor, or just as I said, are predictors. Dr. Tim Cote, who uh, was with the FDA and I heard him say, and I love this, uh, everything we've learned about the human condition, we've learned from people born with rare disorders. They're born without an enzyme, they're born without factor. We figure out how to solve that particular problem, we add to the, whole body of knowledge of science and we move on. Also, even though there are, there are only 200 therapies now, there are 350, but they only cover 200 of the 7,000 diseases. And uh, even though they're all small micro-targeted populations, if you count them overall, uh, or at least if you believe the Eurotis and Nord numbers, it's one in 10 people. So that's not a small, that's 10% of the population. So if we don't include caregivers and patients at the center, um, right now what's happening is they're, they're just going around us. Um, they're, using, they're using the internet, they're activating. So a couple of examples. Deborah Kogan uh, is a mother who was given amoxicillin for strep throat and her four-year-old son, Leo. And after three days of it not getting better, she posted photos of, on her Facebook page. And within a couple of hours, three of her friends suggested that 
uh, should get her son tested for Kawasaki's disease, which it turned out he had, and he got treated then uh, before he had any serious liver disease uh, uh, effect. Some of you may already know this about e-patient Dave. Uh, he was diagnosed with fourth-stage kidney cancer and told to go home and get comfortable. And he went on the Internet, and within 20 minutes on the ACOR site, it's a social media site around cancer, he was told about a potential Novartis drug that was only available in Europe that could potentially save his life. And now five years later, he goes around talking about empowered patients and how Novartis saved his life. Uh, Matt and Lori Sams organized a symposium. These are parents. Uh, for 22 scientists from around the world to try and cure their daughter's illness where no research was being done before. Uh, they raised millions of dollars and they're on track to begin clinical trials this year. Of course, you probably know John Crowley, whose story was in Extraordinary Measures, who had two sick children and developed a drug that, was, uh, uh, that Genzyme brought to market and then has started Amicus Therapeutics. But there are other examples, the Seckler and Wicca families. They started a... Uh, two different companies, one called DART Therapeutics to focus on preclinical trial work, um, specifically innovating um, to think about how to reduce the risk of getting through the FDA, and then also Halo Therapeutics specifically to commercialize a therapy for their sick children because they were unhappy with the pace of development and innovation. And of course, the whole example of HIV. Uh, there's, that's a whole community that, acti that was activated and that was really forcing the issue. So what can we learn from all of this? All the companies in the room, not just the ones focused on uh, the rare disease end of the spectrum, is that patient engagement all the way through the cycle, as far back as research, can, excel can help accelerate development and speed to market, drive innovation, and create better patient outcomes. Thank you to all of you. Um, I'm going to take the chairman's privilege and ask the first question again. Um, you, you had some wonderful examples of um, patients going away and researching their own diseases and coming back to their doctors and saying, this is what you do. And I absolutely accept the point, you know, from even my days as an academic, which was not even in, in medicine, um, that uh, you know, you're constantly 400 years behind the field. Nevertheless, the internet is there. Why can't a doctor do that? Why, why, you know, why, why should... You, and not why should it be left to the patient. It's the doctor's responsibility to come up with these things. If he doesn't know, he could look at the internet and get these, the, get, get these, 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 these little vignettes. Um, isn't there something wrong uh, with the medical attitude if they're not doing that? Well, I think they are doing that. They absolutely are doing that. Um, for, but uh, they're doing that when they need to. They don't do it proactively. They're not going to go to a dinner and listen to something about um, a disease that they may never see, but if a patient, um, and patients aren't doing all the research, it's just a different balance of a relationship. Patients may bring up an idea and bring it to their doctor, and then their doctor will go back and do the, do the research. That's what we're seeing happening. Um, they're, not, they're, not, they're not becoming doctors. <laughs> they're just bringing up the ideas right. and then working in more partnership with their doctors. So, uh, who'd like to kick things off? Yeah, here we are, yes. Yes, Ed Gopper, GSK. I'd like to just follow on that very last question, that if, if somehow the healthcare system doesn't do what was just being suggested, will there be uh, an increase in the inequity in healthcare? Because obviously it's the poorer people who use the internet less and are less educated in how they explore it. So if, 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 if the healthcare system doesn't step forward and do that more proactively, will we not have a, a growing diver, divergence? Who'd like to see that one on? Well, I could, I could share some thoughts. Um, I think the real challenge is how can we help raise awareness amongst physicians about these more rare diseases. So I'd rather focus on the, the role perhaps industry has, but also patient organizations in uh, making information about diseases more accept, ac accessible on the internet perhaps. Mm -hmm. I think there's also probably a role for looking more at symptom clusters and helping to provide algorithms that would speed diagnosis for some of these more unusual uh, diseases. I, I think also, you know, we know that uh, social policy plays a very important role in health as well as uh, 
So when you say that some people don't have access to internet or are not computer literate, etc., there's a part of the responsibility in governments and, and other organizations to make sure that the social policies themselves help uh, create this awareness and, and equip people with the potential to, to find answers or beginning of answers or uh, to, to cope with their own diseases. Should, should somebody, I don't know who it would be, you know, the UK perhaps the Medical Research Council, actually be actively trying to organise you know, the, the, the huge amount of medical research which is out there in a way that doctors and possibly also patients can, can use it more effectively. I mean, I don't know quite how that would work because you know, every journal publishes, has its own publication policies, lots of the stuff's copyright, but you know, much of this is paid for by, the, uh, by, by taxpayers' money. Um, and I'm not aware of anybody who has any overarching responsibility for coordinating the organisation of this information. It might be a really useful resource. It might, you know, might be transformative. You know, we, we're talking about IT, or I think we'll be talking about IT later. What do you think of that idea? Would, it, would that help, or would it just be a, a bureaucratic layer that was useless? Well, I, I think it'd be fantastic to have, uh, I mean, and that's certainly one of the things that I, a lot of government and uh, patient organizations are looking for right now. A lot of patient advocacy groups are developing their own patient registries or compendia, um, and that's one of the biggest issues. We, we certainly have 70% of the drugs that are given in the rare disease in the spectrum are given off-label. And if we don't collect that data and figure out what's happening, what's right. the point? I think in terms of uh, just making available uh, clinical data or research that's been done, uh, part of, uh, I think, uh, certainly the biopharm industry is becoming more transparent with mm -hmm. posting on uh, results of uh, clinical trials that people can access. Uh, but I think uh, part of the problem is everyone's just interested in positive results. Yeah, and absolutely. so there's a huge amount of studies where they're negative or you really don't show much, but actually contain a lot of nuggets that uh, are important to get out there, but they're not published, they're not available. Mm -hmm or they're buried uh, deep on, uh, in various websites. And so I think I agree that if we can have a better way to uh, bring that forward, be much more open, transparent, and knowing what works, but actually more importantly, what doesn't work, yeah. uh, I think would be uh, extremely helpful. Yeah, I think transparency is really important and everybody publishing, etc. Uh, the, the responsibility for going to get the information or making it available, now with the internet, you know, it's crowdsourcing. If lots of people read yes, a little yes, bit yes, and yes. then it's discussed on the internet, then you've got engines that can go and get the answer yes. and that becomes, the, you know, that becomes you know, what you want to know. You don't need to have a, a librarian a, scientific librarian that puts everything together. No, you probably don't, but, but, but possibly you need to have a particular place. I mean, I, I, the, what I was, the model I was thinking of is a thing called Archive, which is where um, by simply an emergent consensus, almost everybody who works in high-end physics um, puts, puts their, their papers there. And, and some of them just go there and die, and some of them go there and are, um, uh, pulled, you know, are enhanced by... Um, robust peer criticism and eventually get published in journals. But it's everybody knows archive is where you go. Um, and that's the point that you would have. That they, I suppose that's what I was thinking of some central place where results can go instead of having to search around and Google for things. You know, you go to the equivalent of archive and that's where it is. Maybe not for the whole of medicine, but you, maybe it would be on a per disease basis. But, but yes. Um, sir. Hi, Mark Beards from Goldman Sachs. I wanted to ask a question on social media. Um, generally, social media has really given the power back to the general public, politically, economically, etc. Um, and yet the pharma industry is unable to, um, it, legally or otherwise, really engage with the general public on development of drugs, on um, off-label use, etc. Particularly you know, the example given with Novartis and a drug that was licensed in a different country. Um, what can the industry do about better use of social media and what should be done more generally about uh, opening that access point? Uh, yes? <laughs> sure. Um, well, pharma, every year we see pharma stepping more and more into using social media. There certainly are pharma companies that are out there first starting just with listening, really listening. What's the language 
that uh, patients are using and what are their greatest unmet need. And then you can respond appropriately through the, through the right channels to deliver um, in the right language and the right, um, and the right kinds of programs. Um, where we'd like, to, where sort of in an ideal world, what you'd want to see is them to be able to be a lot more transparent and to have a real seat at the table. Um, and, you know, there are certainly, I mean, Pfizer has, there, there, are, there are companies that are, that are starting to take steps into that, all with uh, regulated messages. And I guess you wouldn't really want them to not be regulated. <laughs> um, I guess yeah. the question is, how do you regulate it? Because yeah. this is a nightmare what it you're raising nightmare. here in terms of uh, being able to make sure information is true, it's accurate, uh, having the time to reflect on things. I think one of the things I find with social media is how quick things happen and, it, it, and things that may not necessarily even be true become perceptions that are very difficult to uproot uh, along that line. I think uh, in some responsible, measured fashion, I think that there is a future there uh, in terms of, uh, of trying to get the message out about particular drugs, particular diseases, uh, things along that line. But it's, it's going to be a very uh, difficult road to go forward with, uh, uh, with it. I think one just general back comment on that is that as we've all talked about all the partnerships that uh, the biopharmaceutical industry needs to step up to, to lead, to bring medicines out quicker and, and, and better, et cetera. Uh, but there is this whole trust issue that I think because of a number of things that happened that uh, uh, there, there has been some lock, lack, lack or loss of trust over the years and so now's the time we have to uh, regain that, and I think that that's happening as we move forward. Uh, but I think when we think about social media, it, it could lead to some issues of trust, of uh, misuse. Uh, and so I think I would take a somewhat more measured, conservative pathway forward with that, knowing that in the future, yes, we will use it, uh, but uh, I think we need to be very deliberate and careful. But, but even now, if you partner, um, if, if you have an appropriate partnership uh, with a trust agent, with a, with a patient advocacy group, then they'll take your message. They can, you can amplify your message for, well, in fact, you have to be prepared for it to be either positive or negative, so. <laughs> you had a question? Yes. Hi, Jenny Cummins from Takeda. Um, I think Wendy was right, saying that the innovation occurs at the margins. And um, what you seem to be saying is that there are lots of innovative best practice models that we're seeing with orphan drugs and HIV, for instance. How do we then turn this best practice into industry standard? How do we spread it so it's not just the orphan drugs? Well, I think one uh, comment on that is that uh, biologic processes or diseases, and, 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 and they're all very much different. And so even though you might say, well, look at how we took care of HIV, and within 15 years, we essentially uh, had uh, major advances there. Uh, it's a unique, it's a, it's a microbiologic agent, uh, and uh, it was able to be dealt with. Many of the diseases we're dealing with now are uh, degenerative or have multiple causes, and, are, are very, and we don't even know how, what the cause or how to treat them uh, at this time, we just don't have the basic research that's with it. And I agree that taking examples from HIV or from rare diseases, as you said, might be an enzyme deficiency, learning what the lack thereof of that leads to what are all the knock-on effects, et cetera. But I think uh, these are helpful, but it, it's not a simple, well, let's look what they did with this particular disease and make it work across the board. Sorry, maybe my question wasn't clear. I meant more the best practice around patient interaction between the pharma company. How would we, how would we expand that across the industry? So maybe, maybe one thing would be um, really thinking about how do we bring patients in even into clinical trial development or how, do we or how do we involve caregivers more because they're the ones watching the patients at home if it's, you know, if it's pediatric or, or whoever it is. Um, to really, to really uh, take 
take notes and maybe they're going to notice things that weren't even thought of by the researcher that to, that include them more at every sort of every step of the way I think will drive innovation and make us make us have better practice so we don't treat it as us and consumer but a little bit more of a inclusive and let's get the value out from all the different stakeholders at every step so maybe I could just build on that. I, I think the first step might be really genuinely seeing the patient at the center, so exactly what we're talking about, and really understanding and appreciating deeply the contribution that patients can make, which is a little bit different from you know, maybe the way medicine was practiced many years ago, which it was this relationship with the uh, the physician prescriber and, and what they cared about meant the most to the industry. And I think this has changed enormously and the things that, that Wendy talked about, about really looking for and caring about these really subtle differences and the information that you can get from patients and indeed from, from their families is, is really critically important. But the first step, I have, think, has to be as, you know, the definition of what does it really mean that patient is at the center, and it really means a really authentic relationship with them as a, a, a really driving stakeholder in the whole uh, development process from very, very early stages, but through the whole life cycle of a drug in terms of continuing to learn both what it's doing well and what are the gaps, because those are, of course, areas for future innovation as well. Do you think there's any risk, I mean, obviously not in the context of, of fatal diseases. I mean, everybody is very clear in their mind about what's going on there. But the, uh, is, there, is there a risk uh, of, of this leading to pa patients being pandered to, you know, a fifth P, if you like? Um, I mean, I'm thinking of the, it might, might sound trite, but I think it's an important example of you know, the overprescription of antibiotics. Uh, you know, we, we've ended up with a situation, and it's partly because of OTC stuff in Asia, absolutely, but also in the West, it, you know, there's the, you know, here's a, a patient comes into the, into the surgery, doctor has 10 minutes to deal with the patient. Instead of, you know, patient's got a viral disease, instead of saying to the patient, no, you can't have any medicine, go away, wrap yourself up, and it'll go away, you know, your immune system will kill it. Um, yeah, here's an antibiotic, because you're pandering to them, because, because there seem to be, uh, the doctor can no longer be a dictator. Is that a risk? Well, I think that that occurs right now, and I think that, and, and part of the problem is exactly as you said, the system is that uh, the need for educating patients about various diseases. So, in the case of antibiotics, uh, most of half the patients that come in with respiratory symptoms, it's caused by a virus. So giving an antibiotic is completely worthless. Now that might be great for a drug company. They come in, yeah, we're treating half the people get treated. We make a lot of money from it, but they don't need to be treated. Uh, and so, and that's kind of the practices in the past, and it's got us into this situation with widespread resistance and, and, and all kinds of problems with that. But I think it is incumbent on certainly the biopharmaceutical industry to take that responsibility to not do that pandering and not and, and, and really help to contribute education about uh, treatments or that you really don't need a treatment and that really all you have to do is go home and go to bed uh, and you don't need a pill to cure anything and so it is kind of backtracking kind of what our industry does. We create pills or medicines to solve things, but we also have part of the responsibility of identifying and, and telling people you don't need a medicine per se for that type of thing. So it's really taking that responsibility. It all relates to that interaction with the patient, the transparency that, yeah, actually we, you don't need it. So we're not going to give you anything. That would help with the Trust. Sorry? So that would help us with our trust factors. Yeah, absolutely, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, yes, sir. Yes, Boris is from MSD. Just to uh, re respond to that, actually, uh, Merck MSD has numerous programs on, on uh, um, best practice of use of antibiotics, including, in, in, especially in the developing world, we have a lot of training and partnership with the, the Indian government in some of the, 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 the states just for that, to ensure that you know, people just don't pop, pop up antibiotics that they don't need. 
Oh, sorry. Lately, that I think people have recognized this whole problem, and even into the issue of use of antibiotics in livestock, uh, just the whole contribution to emergence of resistance. Kevin Grogan from Pharma Times. Um, I was just wondering, um, Therese was talking about, you know, sort of patient charters, etc., with patient groups, and you talked about uh, maintaining the integrity and independence of those patient groups. I'm wondering, how does that work in practice? Because, you know, there is suspicion in certain areas of the relationship between pharma, patient groups, etc. I was wondering if you give me some details on how that can be avoided, and get rid of that suspicion. So I think at, at its foundation, it's really about transparency. And of course, patient organizations do need support to do the work they do, whether it's disease awareness or um, advocacy support for their constituents, or in fact, many patient organizations sponsor independent research uh, as well. But it's the, it's, uh, you know, the, the, the transparency of the support that we provide that's really uh, at the foundation of it. I, I had a question for John. I, I wanted to ask you down here. Do you think the Vive model would work for other diseases? Um, it, uh, companies coming together to collaborate, something like malaria, for example, um, or is it, are there special characteristics that HIV has that make, make it work just for HIV? Yeah, I think that that's a good question, and uh, I think uh, people are looking to see ultimately the success of Vive, and so I think we're still a works in progress. And I have to say that uh, uh, being involved with the company from the beginning, my thinking on it has uh, changed or it's become more uh, supportive of this focus and allowing us to really devote 100% of our time to a disease uh, that does have uh, continuing needs, a whole host of issues, and, and as I said before, on the cusp perhaps of developing uh, a, a curative type of therapy. So there's enough work to keep you involved in that. And so the danger is, is that if you create small units on too narrow of a focus, then I think that uh, that won't work. But if it's too broad and you're not dealing with discrete uh, areas where you, ha where you essentially know the cause or you know that the treatments are pretty well established, I think that uh, uh, we'll have to see how that works, but uh, certainly I think with uh, HIV that it's... But something like malaria would have exactly those criteria. You know what the, the agent is, you know what the treatments are at the moment, and it's a discrete problem. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, anyone else out there have a question? Yeah, sir. Hi, Andy Jones from AstraZeneca. I was interested in Patrick's comments around behavioral change uh, with patients to drive uh, better health outcomes. If you think about examples such as um, cardiovascular disease, uh, diet and exercise and the impact there, if you think of lung disease and smoking, there's very little evidence that people take on behavioral change in order to improve outcomes. And in fact, there's almost a paradox where as diseases for chronic, as treatments for chronic diseases get better, people are less incentivized to make the lifestyle change. So do you have examples where you've really seen behavioral changes have an impact that are, have actually contributed to, to good well-being outcomes? I think we've seen some in HIV, actually, haven't we? Uh -huh. Sure, I mean, I think... Uh, I, when we think about the whole area of prevention, uh, thinking about uh, uh, eliciting behavioral changes there, I think that uh, we've had some impact, but I think it's interesting, and it kind of goes reverse to what you're saying, is that it's very difficult to get society to change, to do what seems to be kind of a, a simple thing. And so you think about, to prevent HIV, use a condom. It's very difficult to, and it works to some extent, but uh, has not worked that well, is that we still see increasing uh, rates of HIV uh, incidents uh, throughout the world. Uh, and so now you see a whole host of, uh, of uh, therapies coming forward to prevent the spread of HIV. And so very expensive therapies and so, and, and there seems to be, obviously there'll be a lot of debate with that, but some people think that that's 
much easier to deal with than to do a simple thing as getting a very cost-effective uh, uh, condom to do that. But very, very difficult. Uh, and unfortunately, I think it's just that by human nature, maybe we just think it's easier to take a pill. And as I said before uh, on this, is that it's our duty to work to uh, change people, but it's, it's hard. Patrick. Yeah, the, uh, um, you know, there is uh, a lot of uh, analysis and studies about behavioral economics in particular, uh, which could be used very efficiently by pharma companies in particular in the case of, of, uh, of health. And I know I used to be a smoker, and to stop smoking is really hard and unpleasant, and, uh, and uh, you need special motivation, and it's very difficult, it's almost one patient at a time. And then you, uh, and, uh, and you need to understand, to be really close to understanding what triggers a change of behavior. And there are multiple companies that are involved in these things, including in fields outside of, uh, of uh, pharma. Uh, for, for instance, some technology companies like Intel that spend a lot of time studying the behavior of patients. Uh, they're very involved in health. They see health as, as a great potential for increasing their, uh, their revenue and, uh, and their business. And so they spend a lot of time in, I think, about 20 countries looking at uh, 12 different uh, therapeutic areas and understanding better the behavior of patients and their caregivers and their families to be able to see how technology could help change the behavior and make their life easier, make them you know, look better after their own health. So I think there, is a lot of, there are lots of experiments, uh, but it's difficult and it's very... Um, uh, uh, you know, unobvious. Uh, sometimes uh, the opposite of what you think would be would be the right thing. Um, so th there are examples, and I think uh, there are examples also in other industries uh, that would be useful to look at to see how you can implement them into uh, into health. But also, there, there there are two different sorts of behaviour change, if you like. There's individual behaviour change, which I agree is very hard. But there's also social, societal behaviour change, and and in that, smoking has, has changed enormously. Um, uh, not by persuading people who have started smoking to give up, but by stopping people smoking in the first place. You know, I, don't, I couldn't count you the figures off the top of my head, but there's, there's been a huge decrease in the proportion of smokers in this country, and I think in most rich countries uh, over the past 50 years. Um, so you can do social behaviour change, but you've got to get people when they're young and, and stop them starting in the first place. Uh, whether that would apply to condoms, I don't know. Um, but it might. Um, it might, actually. Um, I think we've got time for one more question, if there's one out there. And if there isn't, um, then I would say thank you very much to the panel. It's been a fascinating discussion.